My friends, very good morning to you. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you are joining us in. Uh, welcome to Nomad Mania's Spotlight on the Smallest Nations in the World. I'm your host, Randy Williams. I am a proud card carrying member of Nomad Mania. In May of 2023, I finished my personal goal of visiting all 193 UN nations of the world. It's a very happy moment, and I was happy to have my friends from Nomad Mania cheering me on in person and behind the scenes. Well, you may be asking, why am I wearing this outfit? And why am I speaking in this ambiguous yet uh, extremely sexy accent? Well, you see, in addition to being an extreme traveler by day and a syndicated radio host by night, I also hold the title of Supreme Leader of the United Territories of the Sovereign Nation of the People's Republic of Slow Jamistan. Yes, I am the Sultan of Slow Jamistan, and today I'm coming to you live from the Consulate of the Republic of Slow Jamistan for a very special Nomad Mania webinar, one of the first of its kind. I hope you're excited, as excited as I am, you're in for a treat. Uh, now, some of you may already be familiar with the world of micronations, and today you're in for a special, special treat. But some of you, uh, this might be your very first venture into micronationality. Now, whether you know all about micronations already, you've done your research, you've read the articles, the, uh, the uh, documentaries, or uh, maybe you're here today because you think this is the most absurd thing you have ever heard of, uh, but like a bad car accident, maybe you just have to look. Well, I welcome you too. For everybody, we're going to have a good time. Uh, so today, I challenge you to leave all of your preconceived notions and ideas at the door and endeavor to have a completely open mind as we speak to some of the biggest leaders of the world's tiniest countries. Now, in a moment, I will introduce you to our panel of leaders. They will each have a chance to introduce their country to you. And we've got a few fun topics and questions uh, from the Sultan. And then at the very end, I'll let you, I will let you, the viewers, uh, jump in with your questions. So please save your questions for the very end so they don't get all lost, like all the emails. Um, We'll wait questions at the end, okay? But it's going to be a very fun interactive session, I promise you. Hey, before we start, just a very quick story on how my country, the uh, Sloyamistan, was born. Uh, as a serious traveler like you, we are all serious travelers here, um, I was getting antsy during the, the pandemic. You remember the pandemic was absolutely horrible for everybody, especially if you wanted to travel. Um, I, I'd run out of new nations to visit. All of the countries that I have not seen, they were still locked down. I had nowhere to go. Uh, so it's very frustra fr frustrating. I, I was getting antsy. But I vaguely remembered hearing about a tiny country located inside the United States of America. How could this be? I had to investigate. So I booked a ticket to Reno, Nevada. I jumped into a rental car. I drove 90 minutes south and I arrived at the Republic of Molossia, where I was welcomed very warmly by President Kevin Barr. Now, I had an amazing two hours touring this tiny nation. It was uh, my very first time meeting a sitting president. I didn't know it at the time, but it was on that day in Molossia where the seed of Slow Jamistan was first planted deep inside my head. Two years later, the Republic of Slow Jamistan boasts 11 acres, 16,000 registered citizens. In a short time, Slow Jamistan has become one of the most recognized micronations in the world. That is my story. But alas, Today's panel is not about Slow Jamistan, but rather four incredible and unique human beings that have taken on the role of leader and in some cases founder of their very own country. So, shall we meet them right now? It is my pleasure to introduce His Imperial Majesty George II, the present sovereign head of state of the Empire of Atlantium. His Majesty is a native Australian who played a pivotal role in the nation's development. He ascended to the position of emperor by unanimous acclamation during uh, the time of Atlantium's foundation. And the rest is Atlantium history. By the way, he joins us at the excruciating, painfully hour of three o'clock in the morning in Australia, in Atlantium. So we welcome uh, your majesty. Welcome, welcome. Next, say hello to His Excellency Prince Michael of Sealand. The prince inherited his title in 2012 following the passing of his father, Paddy Roy Bates, uh, the founder of Sealand, born into an extraordinary legacy. Prince Michael has actively managed the affairs of this unique micronation situated off the coast of Suffolk, England. 
Up next, please say hello to Her Majesty Queen Carolyn, the head of state of the Royal Republic of Ladonia, the micronation based in Sweden. The queen was elected by the cabinet of ministers and proclaimed queen on June 2nd, 2011. We had a fantastic time at MicroCon in Chicago. Thanks to the Queen. And finally, he is a personal friend of mine as well as one of the inspirations of Florjamistan, Mr. Zach Landsberg of Zakistan. Now, Zach is an internationally renowned sculptor. He makes the statues and a visionary creator of Zakistan, transforming a remote desert plot into a micronation rich in artistry and imagination. Please, a round of applause for all of us panelists today. I believe we are missing Sealand. I did not see him. So we'll wait to see if Prince Michael joins us. If not, it is uh, the four of us will have a very nice time together. So let's get started. Uh, your questions, viewers, coming at the end, right? So hang on to your questions. First up, good morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to ask each of our leaders uh, to give our audience uh, just a couple sentences that describe your nation. Tell us where your country is located and what makes your nation unique in a world where hundreds of other micro nations exist. I'd like to start, ladies first, uh, with Her Majesty Queen Carolyn of Ladonia. Okay, well, I don't remember the, the first part of those instructions. I only remember the second part. So um, uh, I'll give you a brief intro to Ladonia. Ladonia was founded uh, in 1996 after 10 to 15 years of court battles over some sculptures that were built on the side of a, um, on a beach in Sweden. After the court battles were essentially exhausted, it was determined that Sweden was unable to enforce their laws on that land, which made it therefore Ladonia's land because we control it and possession is nine tenths of the law, right? So we declared independence in 1996. I was not the first queen. I did not join Ladonia until 2000. I joined as a member of the cabinet of ministers. Um, I was a cabinet minister for 11 years when there was a constitutional crisis. The uh, previous queen was missing in action. She was ultimately abdicated in abstentia by the cabinet and then a new, the constitution says a new, a new election must be held. So there was an election. I, I ran, I won, and then I was inaugurated, well, coronated uh, in September of, uh, of 2011. So I've been queen ever since. What makes Ladonia unique? Uh, I think we're, we're quite large. We're rapidly approaching. We're within about 10 new citizens of 29,000. So my goal is to hit 36,000 because that is the population of Monaco. Um, very happy about that. We have survived many coups. We've survived uh, many incursions from the Swedish government and yet our artworks still stand. Uh, we're, still, we're still a sovereign nation and we welcome about 40,000 visitors per year to our shores, which is also exciting. So I think that's that's probably as in a nutshell as I can. It's fantastic. Absolutely perfect. Thank you, Queen Carolyn. Great to have you here. Uh, Zach Landsberg of Zakistan. Uh, tell us about your country. Where is it located? What makes it, uh, what makes Zakistan unique? So <clears throat> Zakistan is two acres of land that I bought in the remote Utah desert in 2005. So uh, Zakistan is in the very northwest corner of bounded by the state of utah so kind of near the nevada and idaho borders it's uh i paid 600 bucks on an ebay auction um i thought i should own a piece of the american west before it's all gone and um that was sort of the snowball that i balled up and sort of rolled down the hill so uh this was kind of the the bush era the kind of post 9 11 thing and i was kind of uh you know young and in and intense, and so I declared Zakistan a sovereign nation. It started sort of as a tongue-in-cheek type thing, and I think over the past 18 years, it's gotten a little more serious. So it's quite remote. It's 50, 50 miles past the last gas station, 15 miles on dirt roads, and another... Uh, it used to be three miles hiking straight through the desert. Now it's a kind of rough three miles on a 4x4 four four track. So there's a little customs booth immigration station out there, and I've put some monuments... And I kind of had a viral moment in 2015. So 
Um, in terms of the land itself, yeah, it's uh, it's a little speck in the middle of the desert. But in terms of kind of the nation of Zakistanis and uh, people who have touched the project and who have been associated with the uh, nation of Zakistanis and Zakistan is uh, has grown quite large over the past you know, 18 years. I noticed that cameraman was missing his shirt. Was it very hot in uh, Zakistan that day? Yes. It was kind of excruciatingly hot and, uh, you know, also there were dust storms and such. So, of course. Well, it's fan fantastic to have you, my friend. Uh, let's talk to His Imperial Majesty George II of the Empire of Atlantium. I watched a fantastic uh, National Geographic uh, small documentary on your great nation and uh, last night. And it was just it moved me to tears. I was very impressed and I hope to visit you soon. Uh, so I'm excited for you to tell everybody about your country. Where is it located and uh, what makes it unique? Atlantium was founded as largely a global governance advocacy towards the tail end of the Cold War on the 27th of November 1981 um, by me and two of my cousins. Uh, Atlantium occupied at that time a 10 square metre piece of concrete behind the garage of my parents' house in southwestern Sydney and uh, subsequently uh, moved to a um, somewhat larger 60 square metre territory uh, in inner Sydney uh, towards the end of the late 1990s. And uh, then in 2008, uh, we moved to our current um, province of Aurora, which is where our capital city, um, Concordia, is located. Uh, this is about 300 kilometres southwest of Sydney uh, in a pastoral area of uh, regional New South Wales, about two hours west of the Australian capital uh, of Canberra. And uh, we, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, sovereign entity, um, are a global non-territorial state. So in that context, we're actually the largest country in the world. We have about 3,000 citizens scattered across about 120 countries. Um, in terms of uh, territorial imperium, we exercise um, our authority over the province of Aurora, which is uh, three quarters of a square kilometer in extent, 100. 96 acres for those who use the older style measurements. Um, and uh, here we have uh, our, uh, our capital, Concordia, which is the site of Government House, the Golden House, uh, also our General Post Office, uh, the only pyramid on the Australian continent, one of our commemorative monuments, the Pyramid of the Dawn, uh, our, uh, and, and several uh, Roman style commemorative columns, all of which serve to attract uh, tourism uh, to this uh, beautiful part of the world. Fantastic. Welcome today. Great to have you. Uh, look, let's get it over with the elephant in the room. I'm going to just open my mouth and say it uh, because it's the question that I get asked often from uh, my own family, my friends, uh, my co-workers. Uh, the question is why? Why do you do this? Have you gone mad? Her Majesty Queen Carolyn, you're up. Um, you know, arguably one could say yes. Uh, it's, uh, it is a lot of work and it's, um, I wasn't the founder, so I would, I would probably say the madness slide was laid there. I feel like I was given a gift. It's a, it's a gift and a responsibility. You know, it's not every day that someone says here, would you like to wear this crown and be our leader? And when you're offered that and you accept it's, it's a responsibility. So I look at it as a responsibility to, preserve the artworks to continue the the idea and the ideal and maintain the legacy so that there's something to continue and pass down to future generations. So have I gone mad? I, you know, I suppose that's that's subjective. <laughs> and there are people that would say yes. Fantastic. Zach, what about you, my friend? Do you have those same questions from people? Do they say, what are you doing? Why are you crazy? I feel like I asked myself that. Uh often um i think I, I took a break uh for a couple of years recently and sort of came back to it and uh yeah the zakistan is something that i created initially but uh is has grown kind of quickly and and over the years is uh something larger than than me people who i don't know visit it uh take their friends out there um it's a kind of a countercultural, subcultural thing in Salt Lake City now. Um, the thing is, is, is larger than um, 
what I initially did. And so I think there's a, aspects of it which are a monstrous hassle of uh, hauling water and equipment and everything to the middle, essentially the middle of nowhere um, to do, you know, essentially like uh, the uh, thing with, with, that, with the least amount of utility that I can think of. Um, but I think basically performing the trappings of nationalism of uh, kind of making this thing appear real or shaping it, um, this idea that there is a place where that exists, that people can go, that is inclusive, that is a hope space, uh, that idea is powerful and semi-related to the reality of what's out there, but also I think important for other people to project kind of what they think, uh, you know, their countries, this country, our countries could be someday. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, His Imperial Majesty George II, the Empire of Atlantium, do you face these same uh, questions from, uh, especially from people close to you? I faced those questions very much when I was a 15-year-old doing this in the corner of my parents' backyard. Uh, subsequently, things have taken on somewhat a more substantive, substantive cast over the years, and uh, I think I've overcome those initial concerns, certainly from uh, my close family members. They do follow the activities of Atlantium with a, with a degree of pride, I think, these days. Uh, but uh, the question of insanity, um, yeah, I think uh, what we are all engaged in is a type of performative um, insanity. I often describe Atlantium uh, as a sustained, internally consistent performance art project that's been sustained over many decades now. And I would point out to people that this is not something that I spend every waking moment of my life involved in, and I, I think probably my colleagues here uh, would uh, uh, would uh, have the same experience. This is one rather long, continuous thread that's been running through my life uh, that's certainly made it a lot more interesting uh, than it would have perhaps been otherwise. I've certainly met a lot more people and been able to engage with the sorts of people that I wouldn't otherwise have expected to meet in life. So it's been it's been very interesting um, and uh, personally useful to me in many respects. Uh, but yeah, raving insanity, probably not. Difficult to maintain a project of this nature um, for so many decades if you're a raving lunatic. I, at this point, I, I want to remind all of our viewers to, uh, after the webinar, make sure to follow everybody on social media, make sure to go down the rabbit hole on YouTube. Um, all of the micronations today are so uh, very well known and there are lots of documentaries and pieces about them and also very different as well. And uh, you learn so much. Um, back to the weirdness thing. I remember I used to uh, I used to make fun of people. For example, uh, I used to go to Comic-Con and, and call the people. These are weird. Why, why do these people wear in the costumes? And I would be very judgy. I would call people weird. And I've been notified that after Slow Jamistan, my girlfriend says, uh, Randy, you can never, ever call anybody weird again because uh, there is no one more weird than you. So I think we have all come to finally embrace it and, and not take it as, a, as an insult. But we say, yes, we are a little mad, yes? Um, well, um, let's talk about our Nomad Mania members today who are all extreme travelers. They love to travel to new places. They love to explore, whether it's a, a new culture. Uh, to see new things, or simply some of us just like to check off a box. We have a list. We want to see all 193, or we want, we want to see every uh, football stadium in the world. Um, I would like to ask all of our leaders this. Can anybody visit your micronation at any time? And if yes, what might they experience when they arrive physically if they were to go there? So we'll start with uh, Her Majesty Queen Caroline of Ladonia. I want to go to Ladonia. Is it possible? Absolutely, it's possible. It's a little bit of a hike. Um, the road, the closest you can get by car is two and a half kilometers. So there's a two and a half kilometer hike once you once you park your car successfully. It's a bit it's a bit steep and rocky for the very last portion because it is down the side of a mountain. Um, you will encounter sharp rocks and trails and uh, eventually, you will approach the entrance to a labyrinth, which is about, you know, at least 75 tons of driftwood. It's 
nine nine stories tall. It's it's huge. So you climb through this labyrinth to get down to the water. Nimus is, yeah, there we go. Nimus is, um, it was architecture without a plan. So we knew what we were starting to build, but there were no there were no plans, and it was all constructed using what was available on hand, which was driftwood, driftwood and dead wood from the nearby forests. So there are there are nails sticking out. There are pieces that break from the elements. We have people out there every weekend working to maintain the structures and keep them repaired. That's arcs right there, which is a it's a castle, but each brick is labeled and considered a page. So it's a stone book, which grants it automatic copyright protection in the global marketplace. So that was a, a sneaky thing that we did to make sure that it couldn't be torn down. Um, Arcs is a little bit difficult to get to from Nimis because the rocks on the beach, when we say it's a rocky beach, the rocks are boulders. They are the size of Volkswagen beetles. They're gigantic. So you're kind of clamoring over those trying to get over to where Arx is. And because of the rocks also, it's difficult to approach by by water because there's really no good place to, to pull your boat up. You're probably going to get wet. We get kayakers a lot, but they do end up in the water to, to get up on the beach. If you come during the summer, probably awesome. The weather in Sweden in the summer is amazing. There's almost 24 hours of daylight. It's tons of fun. This time of year though, you're losing daylight quickly. I mean, there, there are days I've been there, it's horizontal rain, everything's muddy. The, the water is on top of a layer of leaves, which means you can't really see where you're going. And the daylight, you lose daylight at basically 3.30 in the afternoon. So my recommendation would be try to go in the summer. In the summer though, it's crowded. There are a lot of people going up and down all the time. The difference is the Europeans especially are used to hiking and the Americans are generally not. It is it is a hike. It's not so bad on the way down. On the way back up, though, you know, I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack all the time. But it's um, it is definitely a hike, and I would try to go when you have when you know you have enough light and the weather is not going to be too cold. Fantastic, um, Mr. Zach. Uh, your micronation is surrounded by America. If uh, someone's taking a road trip uh, across the, the great uh, states of America and they find themselves near Zakistan, you recommend they visit? Uh, it sounds like it's a little bit off the road, yes? It's a little, yeah, that might be a little understatement. Um, it's, uh, yeah, like I described, uh, my, my friends sort of describe if, uh, if there, you look at a picture of North America at night, they say that Zakistan is the darkest spot. Um, <laughs> It, so it makes for excellent stargazing and, you know, uh, epic sunsets. Um, it's sort of near uh, an old ghost town on the Transcontinental Railroad. And so, again, it's 50 miles past the last gas station. So if you see gas, you want to fill up there because there's nothing in between. And then from there, there's a you know kind of complex um set of dirt roads and turns and left at this fork right at this fork and then kind of down a specific ridge and into zakistan so i mean the figuring out the navigating the not getting cell reception and the you know squinting and trying to find things on the horizon is kind of part of the experience and so uh it's it's a little bit separate from kind of uh i don't know the, the flag and the lapel pins and the the, the performance thing and there's something there's something very odd and uncanny about being out there and going out to a place uh that really like uh has no ridges has no waterfalls has no vista points um you know in the desert there are times where there's no sound there's no wind and there's no animals there's no birds chirping and so your ears start to ring um because there's no input and so that's the uh that's the allure of going out there but if you were to travel out there i would highly recommend bringing several gallons of water per person uh definitely a spare tire or two a bike pump in case that in case you get stuck in the the sand or dirt um and uh yeah a high clearance four by four vehicle would be ideal 
All right. Fantastic. Looks like it is worth it, though, when you get there. Not many people can say they visited Zakistan. Let's talk about the empire of uh, Atlantium. Again, I, I watched the video yesterday. It, uh, well, it's a beautiful nation. Um, your Majesty, um, how might people visit? Is it open to anybody? What's the uh, protocol to visit your nation? Uh, to visit uh, Atlantium's province of Aurora, uh, anyone can visit. Uh, the opportunity exists for people to rent the entire country via Airbnb uh, for something in the region of uh, 200 US dollars a night. This is the only nation on the planet that can be rented in this way, possibly Liechtenstein, I think, maybe in the same boat. But I think they charge a little bit more. Just uh, Atlantium itself uh, is, compared to Ladonia and Zakistan, um, a breeze to travel to, assuming you make the journey to the Australian continent first. Uh, we are about 330 kilometres by paved road from uh, Sydney. Uh, we're about uh, 200 kilometres by paved road from Canberra. Uh, the paving stops at the border which uh, is about 200 metres down uh, the Via Concordia, the one and only highway in Atlantium, which is not a paved road. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, rough affair, but um, only a couple of hundred metres from the border to Government House, where I'm currently ensconced. The landscape itself, uh, we're on the, uh, the western side of the Great Dividing Range, which runs down the east coast of the Australian continent. So it's a, a very um, hilly uh, location. Uh, Atlantium's uh, province of Aurora, uh, like Rome, has seven hills. There are actually a lot more than that. We've just chosen to name seven of them. And we're located in the valley, uh, the river valley of the Lachlan River. Uh, which is about a kilometre from our northern border. And uh, here we have Government House, numerous monuments. Also, we host our um, uh, IGFA, the Imperial Gallery of Fine Art, which is a, uh, a collection of uh, Australian landscape uh, oil paintings, largely, it's about 30 or 40 paintings we have here now. And uh, people uh, visit here a because it's an interesting destination, a little bit different from most other rural uh, accommodation uh, venues in uh, this part of the world uh, because of the monuments and the, uh, the Atlantium overlay, uh, but also because it's a, a beautiful, uh, physically beautiful area with a significant amount of wildlife. Uh, we have kangaroos, wallabies, echidnas, lizards, all sorts of parrots that, uh, that are regular visitors here. Uh, kangaroos you'll often find right outside the door of Government House uh, for first thing in the morning. That's cool. That sounds like a blast. All right. It is, uh, it is noted on my list of places to go. Actually, all of your micronations are. Um, this has been uh, fantastic and exciting. My friends, we have about uh, about 15 minutes left, and I, I really wanted to give people a chance to to ask some questions, the viewers, the, especially the people that are brand new to the, uh, the micronation uh, subject. Uh, I see Pio has a great question. Everybody hold your question because uh, I have one final question and then we're going to open it up and uh, let everybody uh, let everybody jump in. But I see some good questions coming in already. So thank you so much. Hold that for the end. Uh, my final question for everybody, and it's going to be kind of a rapid fire, a very quick answer if you could. Um, uh, but as a world leader myself, uh, I tell you that consistent, consistently uh, the most asked question after the question, have I gone mad? After that question, the, the second most asked question from especially the press and uh, and people doing interviews and even everyday people, uh, they ask it, uh, is your country a real country? Uh, and I have an answer, but uh, I want all of you to answer. Is your country a real country? And then you must say why or why not? And we'll do it maybe 60 seconds uh, per person and then we can um, let all of our viewers uh, jump in and ask the questions. Let's start with the uh, the Queen. Queen Carolyn, is, uh, is Ladonia a real country? Why or why not? I would say yes, it's a real place with a functioning government that holds regular elections and accepts citizens. We enforce our borders. Uh, we fulfill most of the functions of a real country. In fact, sometimes more than some of the real countries do themselves. So, yeah. Fantastic. Mr. Zach, same question. Uh, I would say not yet. Um, I think there are things the Zakistan nation, the group of people that identifies with Zakistan is real. The territory, the physical space is real. 
but the state, the capacity to do that is not done yet. And so I'm the the image I'm projecting is uh, we're building this country with our hands and it's taking, you know, and it's a big job and it's going slow. And we kind of did the monuments first and we're sort of working our way up. So it's on its way. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. Um, uh, Your Majesty George II, uh, Atlantium, is it a real country or no? Of course, it's a real country. It's a place that you can visit. It exists and uh, projects uh, its activities into the corporeal world. Our representatives in numerous parts of the world, specifically India, Brazil and parts of South America, have engaged with actual presidents, world leaders um, on various occasions, all of which is well documented. So we also produce banknotes, coin stamps, have flags flying on, on flag staffs, um, and uh, we have real buildings and monuments. So absolutely. We don't have a beer, though. We need to fix that. We can import this Lojamistan lager. It is being made right now. So we'll, we'll do a trade deal later. All right. Uh, my friends, thank you so much for joining us now. Um, I see some good questions coming in. If you've already asked a question, it might have been a, a bumped way up. So if you want to start with uh, with new questions, my friend, uh, we will take them one by one. I did want to start with my friend Pio. Uh, and uh, Pio asked, what is the availability of land like in America for those who would be interested in, in setting down bricks and, uh, and mortar? I think Zach's story is fantastic. I'll give you my quick story. But, but Zach... Uh, you bought your land off of eBay, yes? Yeah, I don't. I don't think they let you do that anymore. Um, I mean, the land that I own was kind of a land scam. It wasn't subdivided properly. I mean, I paid six hundred bucks for two acres. So I think there's a lot of land available in America, although a lot of it is, is very inaccessible um, and difficult to get to. So um, I would say. It's doable, but there is a cost that uh, doesn't cut. Doesn't you don't pay in money, but you maybe pay in sweat and difficulty. I um, when I looked uh, started looking for land, I was inspired by Molossia and, and Zakistan as well. I use Zillow uh, and a couple of other, other websites. And as Zach mentioned, uh, plenty of land uh, in America, but lots of it very far away. Of course, uh, I'm from California and uh, very expensive in California. So to get anybody anything in the state was hard. I was looking at places in Arkansas and, and Oklahoma and Texas. But who wants to go there? Not me. Um, so yes, uh, difficult, but you can do it. Uh, you you should come up with your own filters, your own criteria of what, what you want. For me, it was a, a small list. It was, I wanted something uh, drivable from where I lived. Uh, number two, over five acres. And number three, accessible. And then, of course, number four, under a certain price range. And it turned out I only found one place that met all the filters. So I bought it very quickly. It's uh, to check all the boxes, it can be tough. Uh, all right, uh, let's see. Um, so someone with the screen name Super Forgettable has a question, and I'd, I'd actually like the Queen of Ladonia to answer this question first. And uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on micronational summits? Of course, the Queen was uh, the host of our last one, so it is a great question for you to answer. Um, that is a very broad and unspecific question. Micronational summits are a great opportunity for everyone to get together and meet. Uh, see each other in, in person, have discussions, have develop rapport that is quite different from just being on the other side of a screen. So I think they're nice in that, you know, diplomacy can be done. Diplomacy is very difficult to have happen, I think, virtually when it's exclusively virtual. It's nice to be able to get together. It's an excuse to travel, to see other places, to visit other micronations, I think, all in all, they're they're a good thing. I mean, obviously, they don't happen all the time, which makes them more special. So, I, I think if you have the opportunity to attend one, it's definitely a, a good idea. It's educational, it's fun, and like I said, it is a good opportunity for for diplomacy, real life, in person, face to face diplomacy. Uh, Asa Asa Grady asked a question and. Um, uh, it is a very interesting subtopic of of the micronational summit question, and that is uh, the children. I was uh, I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, that there there were lots of parents and families, and their children had come up with the micronational hobby as well. I mean, kids I think as young as uh, maybe even seven or eight were there in little dictator uniforms, having a good time. Um, the question is, uh, 
for the kids who attended and those simply uh, that do not have much experience in the community, what, uh, what inspiration uh, or pieces of advice would you give them? This goes for the whole panel. What would you say for uh, minors who want to uh, start this, uh, this hobby of micro-nationalism? Um, if I could jump in real quick first, the, I, think, I think attending these events, knowing that you're going representing your nation and there will be adults there, adults who are in the micronational community and other people that have more experience in the micronational community. I think it is a, I think it is, it's a fast track to developing that social awareness of how, how to behave, how to present yourself in formal, real, I mean, real diplomatic situations. It's the best way to learn sometimes is by doing. So you're going into it to have fun, but you're also getting a lot of experience with public speaking, with um, social interactions that require some, some level of, of proper behavior and decorum. And you're getting an opportunity to hear other people and see their facial expressions, talk about their micronations too. So you're learning how to be a micronationalist by being around micronationalists. And I think that's that's a valuable thing for the kids who attended. Fantastic. For the group, a uh, question from Mr. Ben Walker. Uh, does anyone in the group have uh, current plans to expand your micronational uh, footprint uh, land-wise? We do. I, I mean, we've been, we've been shopping for abandoned villages in Spain and Italy for quite some time. So we haven't found one that quite fits the bill, but it is likely if we expand, it's going to be somewhere with a um, a little uh, warmer climate. No plans for expansion uh, beyond uh, the current province for Atlantium, other than perhaps a, a special territory in regional Victoria, the state south of New South Wales, uh, which is mostly going to be where I think I'm going to retire to in a few years. Zach, any uh, territorial territorial expansion? Do you, let me ask you this, Zach. Do you know your neighbors? The land around you is it? Do you know if it's available? Is it owned by the government? Uh, what what's happening outside of the borders? It's kind of complicated. I do have I have a few neighbors, um, and yeah, desert people are a little strange. So uh, my neighbor owns the airstrip slash ghost town that's about thirty miles as the crow flies from Zakistan. Um, I bought two acres so I could tell people I own a couple of acres. I think um, more of nothing is still nothing. So I have no plans to expand any territory. And I also, I think at this point, the idea of sort of claiming and, and grabbing territory is a little, eh, a little problematic in the, this day and age. I think I'm more interested in uh, expanding, I don't know, the cultural capital, if you will. Fantastic. Excellent. All right. I was uh, accused of colonialism uh, by, uh, by a wokester on the, uh, on the social media. I'm like, look, I just, it's like buying land. I'm just, I bought land. No one's dying. No one's getting thrown out. But uh, people, people take it different ways. So I can uh, understand your feelings there. Uh, our, our friends at uh, Nomad Mania ask a, a question, and it is a good one. Are micronations only for fun? I'd like to, to ask the king this, uh, your majesty. Are micronations only for fun? Or can they actually play a real role in the world stage? Um, if you take um, a, uh, an approach that's reasonably serious and uh, respectful, um, you can have a real impact. We uh, in Atlantium have a diplomatic corps that's made up of about 15 people in various parts of the world. And what we've found is that... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, particularly in uh, parts of the developing world, um, people take the concept of micronations a lot more um, seriously than they do perhaps in the uh, more developed parts of the planet. Uh, primary examples uh, for Atlantium are India and Brazil, where our representatives are personally very well connected to the existing um, political establishment to the extent that uh, the Brazil, uh, our Brazilian representative, Count Lamartine de Hollanda, um, has been invited um, on our behalf to the inaugurations of um, the last three Brazilian presidents, uh, was able to donate uh, one of our coins to the Brazilian Mint Museum 
uh, at a ceremony uh, uh, at which the former Vice President Maciel was uh, officiating. Uh, similarly, in India, uh, we have two very active representatives who engage with um, visiting ministers from such uh, neighbouring countries as Iran, Nepal, um, Thailand and so forth. Um, and one of our Indian representatives again donated one of our coins to the Salajang Museum in Hyderabad, uh, which is the largest museum in South Asia. And uh, the ceremony was officiated by the Minister of Education of the Indian state of uh, Maharashtra, uh, who was quoted in the media as saying, uh, countries like Atlantium have a great future in the world. So I, um, I think that uh, if, you, uh, if you take an approach that uh, treats people with, uh, with the sort of respect that they uh, perhaps uh, expect, then that will be forthcoming uh, to you as a micronation in return. Fantastic. Um, almost out of time, about four minutes on the clock left. A quick question. Anyone can take this if they'd like. Uh, but P.O. Ask at uh, 9.34 uh, is the comment. Uh, do you have any recommendations for, uh, King, you talked about coins and minting. Any recommendations for coin minters, banknote printers, uh, producers of other physical uh, items such as uh, passports um some of the uh some micronations have uh, very rudimentary uh money on the construction paper and then others have uh uh very very fancy banknotes and and coins um a couple of tips uh quickly from the uh the group well when when atlantium started we uh made very heavy use of uh photocopier technology we've subsequently moved on to uh to proper printing uh these days um, but uh, the actual uh, suppliers that we use, uh, we'll keep under wraps for now. Okay. Good right. suppliers are hard to find. So I, I can see why people wouldn't be interested in sharing who does that work for them. You know, for the coin minting, though, there is a, you can order custom dies, I think they're called. They're like molds that you can put into a machine and you put the blank in and you hit it with a sledgehammer and it presses your coin. For very small micronations that are looking for very small runs, the initial cost, the, the initial investment isn't the cheapest, but it's not the worst. And you can then reuse it as often as you like to print on demand rather than, or create on demand, rather than having to order a lot of, you know, a thousand or 5,000 coins from a mint, which is going to cost a lot of money. So I would, um, I'd recommend going the DIY route, uh, check out like the Renaissance fairs and even online like Etsy, I'm sure you can, you can find some place to help you with that. Yeah, I think the, the fact that we even have the, uh, the asset to, to online, if it was 20 years ago, we would, uh, I would not know how we could find anything or even promote our own micro nations, but really uh, the world can be yours uh, for a very small price. It's, uh, I think we can all agree it's, uh, it's more about heart and uh, intention and in many cases, hard work and, and sweat and creativity uh, than it is actual um, having physical things. Yes, of course, it's nice to be able to buy the passports, but uh, again, I think a micro nation's heart and intent and uh, creativity is at the soul of any successful uh, micro nation. It is absolutely free to have a YouTube channel or to claim your uh, backyard or your local park as your micro nation. Really, anyone can do it. Uh, my hat's off to uh, President Ba, who has a very nice page on how to start your own micro nation. So if you uh, viewers are listening and want to uh, start their own country, they are inspired. Uh, you can start very small, uh, like Kazakhstan or Sloyamistan. We just had one little sign in the desert, desert land. And uh, who knows how big you can grow. Uh, but uh, you guarantee to have some fun with it. Uh, I would like to thank my guests uh, before we hand it over to uh, Harry from uh, Nomad Mania. Her Majesty Queen Carolyn of Ladonia, thank you so much for joining us. It is nice to see you again. Uh, Zach Landsberg of Zakistan. Zakistan, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry to have missed His Excellency Prince Michael of Sealand, but perhaps uh, next time he can join us. Of course, His Imperial, Imperial Majesty George II of the Empire of Atlantium. Your Majesty, hats off to you, and thank you so much for your wisdom and for waking up very early in the morning. Let me ask you, are you just going going to go to bed now, or did you, did you wake up very early? Are you coming home from the club? What was the scenario? <laughs> there are very few clubs in this part of the world. Uh, yeah, four hours sleep uh, prior to this event, not sufficient. So I will be returning to bed immediately. 
You are a good man. You are a good man. Thank you all of you for joining us today. Uh, we'll stick around. We'll do a little. Uh, by the way, before we go, follow everybody on the social medias. They have the YouTube channels, the uh, the Twitter, the the, uh, the Facebook. Um, they have lots of amazing things to share. I think you will be enlightened and entertained and uh, inspired and at very least make a new friend from our micronational leaders all around the world. Uh, good people. You can find them with a simple Google search or all of the links on the uh, Nomad Mania webinar page. There they are with the Facebooks and the uh, Instagram and the website links. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining us and for all the great questions as well. I believe we have a good friend of mine and um, the man behind Nomad Mania, one of them, uh, Mr. Harry Mitsidis. Are you here, my friend? Good evening. Hello, Sultan, uh, your majesty. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you very much for having this webinar. Uh, it has been delightful. I, I I don't think I was always into micronations, but I think the existence of Slow Jamistan has inspired me. And, and now I'm getting into this much more, you know, so so I really owe you one, Sultan. We had, a, we had a very nice meeting in Tucson, Arizona, and then I know you ventured to the promised land, and all of a sudden I saw you sneaking crocs uh, across the border of Slogamistan, which of course is very illegal, but uh, it was, uh, I understand you were making a joke, but... <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to forgive me, but I cannot follow rules. If there's a rule, I'm going to break it. So it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it was too hard for me not to. I bought the crocs specially. I have never worn Crocs before or after, so I only wore them in slow Jamistan. Let's make it the last time, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'll wear them again. Um, now, <laughs> what I'd like to do now, we had a Nomad Mania poll about micronations. Um, we came up with a few nice questions. Uh, we didn't get an awful amount of answers, uh, an awfully large one, because... Um, this month was also our awards month, and I think we focused a lot on that, and people were focused on that, but we did, did get 202 responses. So the first question we had was, have you ever visited a micronation? Well, what percentage do you think answered yes? And remember, these are nomad mania people. So what percentage do you think have visited one? I would guess let's go for let's go for broke. I would guess uh, if they're voting in it, maybe they have an interest. I'll say seven uh, percent. Okay, it was sixty percent. Wow, sixty percent of the respondents have visited a micro nation. Now we didn't ask which one, but that is impressive. That does tell us that the. Nomad Mania community does get around. But remember, micronations might be places like Christiania in Copenhagen, which is a very easy one to get to, I imagine. Yes. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily all very obscure. Now, um, the other question we had, are you a citizen or do you have a title from any micronation? So what percentage do you think answered yes to that? Uh I was blown away by the first answer, so all bets are off now. I will say, uh, let's say 20%. No, here it was it was indeed lower. Here it was 7%. So, and I believe I'm probably one of those yes answers, as I am a very proud citizen of Slow Jamistan. Thank you, Sultan. For did, you not, uh, did, did you not receive the letter? Your citizenship was revoked after you bought the Crocs. I'm just joking. I was, I was elated, you know. <laughs> Have you have you rejected requests for citizenship? No, I tell you, citizenship is a uh, very low bar for citizenship. Uh, we, we make citizenship free for everybody. If uh, if they want extras like the passport, things that cost money, there is a small fee. But uh, no, we have uh, currently over 16,000 citizens, which is more than two UN nations of uh, Tuvalu and Nauru. So we are ranking up there. That is amazing. Fabulous. Now... The question, do you believe micronations count as visited countries? So do you believe micronations count as visited countries? Would you answer yes to that? I'll be honest, I'm not sure even if I would 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 answer it because, you know, look, uh, then you get into the territories and, well, is Greenland a country, is Kosovo a country, etc.? Um, so, look, I think everybody has 
different lists and just like Nomad Mania, Nomad Mania has di different categories, right? So it depends what category is. As you are looking at the master ranking, you can pick UN, you can pick UN plus, etc. So along the Nomad Mania path, where we have different uh, situations or different uh, subsets, uh, I would say yes. All right. Well, our respondents said yes. Well, thirty-two percent said yes. So that means that it's largely a no in terms of visited countries. And then we had a question, do you think micronations should have representation in international forums? And again, the predominant answer here was no. 72% said no in international forums. Of course, that question is a bit vague. We didn't specify which forums. Then we had a question, should micronations be included in Nomadmania's main region list? That is the main list of 1,301 regions. What is your guess, Sultan? Would the no or the yes be dominant here? Well, on the last couple of questions, I caught an air of uh, pessimist and negativity a little bit, by the way. I, I demand all the uh, names and addresses of all the people who voted no, so we can of have course. a small... small do, you, do, you have a suitable, do you have a suitable gulag in Slow Jamistan? We have the Slow Jamistan re-education camp we can talk about later, but uh, uh, I would say for the main region, uh, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they said no, but I'm curious, uh, what does the data say? Again, um, well, a surprising amount said yes. So 34% um, said yes. So it is mostly no, but it's a one third yes, which should be seen as encouraging. However, now we have the encouraging questions and answers. So would you attend an event hosted by a micro nation? And here we've got 65% um, saying yes. That means we have... Quite a few people who might be interested in microcon, I suppose, but also if micro nations advertise their events, um, and possibly we could we could be helpful in that as well, then people might be inspired and might actually want to join them. Then we have a question: Do you think micro nations contribute positively to global diversity? And here again, a very uh, sort of optimistic response, 64% answer yes. So almost two thirds of the respondents do believe that micronations contribute to global diversity. Um, now, the question everyone has been waiting for, should micronations be included in Nomad Mania's dare list? That is the list of quirky, extreme regions. What do you think, Sultan? Did people approve of that? Well, for your sake, I hope they did, my friend. Yes. Okay, now let me let me just say that up to now, Nomad Mania has had uh, a sort of, uh, I wouldn't say negative, but uh, perhaps questions whether we should or shouldn't add regions to our dare list. We do have three places which I would say qualify as micronations, and those are Sealand, Suborga, and Christiania. This is because all three are more than 50 years old. They have quite a long history of existing. Christiania is within the city of Copenhagen. Sealand is off the coast of Britain. And Suborga is a village... Um, in Italy, near the border with France, near Ventimiglia, which has its own flag and sort of has a claim to independence, to not really being part of the Italian um, Republic. So up to now, we have questioned this. However, and this surprises me as well, 74% of our respondents say yes. Nomad mania should include micronations into our dare list. And on that note, I bear news tonight to the nomad mania community. A news that I think the Sultan will be very happy to hear. Now, back in March of last year, when we met 
in Tucson, or was it end of February, the Sultan wrote a letter. So when, when the Sultan uh, gave me my uh, application of citizenship uh, and my passport, and I was very happy, at the same time, there was a letter. And can we see this letter in detail? And what exactly does it say? So in the second paragraph, it says, the Sultan hereby respectfully requests that the Republic of Slojamistan be added to the nomad mania list of regions by the end of quarter one, 2023. Well, we did nothing in that quarter and we have done nothing until now. However, given Slojamistan's 16,000 citizens, who are obviously legitimate and very supportive of the Republic of Slojamistan, and given the response of our community, I am very happy to say that as of tomorrow, Slojamistan will be on our DARE list of regions. And as of tomorrow, we are starting to increase our DARE list. We will be adding five new places or regions in our DARE list every Sunday. And the sky is the limit. This is a list that's going to grow. We're going to set the bar higher and higher. And Slojamistan will be one of the five places that you are going to see um, online tomorrow. So I encourage everyone in the Nomad Mania community to visit Slojamistan. And if you dare and you want to be a dissident like me, I will be very happy to see your photos with Crocs creating scandals and incidents at the border. <laughs> hold on, um, hold on, hold on. This is important. Hang on. Hold on. <laughs> yes, uh, the plan with Harry, call it off. He's okay. He's good. He's he's on our team. Yes, cancel it. Okay, thank you. We are very excited, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a huge honor. It is a important day for the Republic of Slojamistan, all of its citizens and parliament members. Uh, we have many of them uh, on the uh, chat right now, like uh, the Don Samwadi and CJ and uh, and Glenn and all of our parliament. They're they're. They're rousing applause right now. You can't hear them, but they are very excited. And uh, and we thank you for this incredible honor. Uh, very quickly, for those uh, now putting Slow Yamasan on their list, if they go to our social media or subscribe to our newsletter, we'll actually tell them when we have a big event. Uh, they can come when we are not there. Uh, for example, Harry, you came when we were not there. It was very lonely, just you and the sand and the wind and the tumbleweeds. But a few uh, times a year, we do have a big party. We bring all the vehicles. We have a fire truck and a police car. Uh, parliament members, the flags, the cupcakes, Kool-Aid tasting, a music limbo contest. It's a lot of fun. So please uh, join us at an event or by yourself. It is up to you. But uh, we welcome Nomad Mania to Slow Yamistan. <laughs> Let me also say that Slow Jamistan features heavily in my recent book, Welcome to the Hotel Nomad Mania. Uh, in fact, you, Sultan, are... Uh, a cat or a fictionalized version of yourself is a character in the book. So I find that the book is a very good way to celebrate micro nations as a whole. But Slow Jamistan kind of has a bit of a leading position there because of your presence. So fans of Slow Jamistan should get a hold of a copy of that book. And I'm sure they will enjoy, um, you know, they will enjoy the intricacy of the plot and how it involves the Republic of Slojamistan within the plot. We are going to add it as an official selection in our Slojamistan book club, which meets every third Tuesday at the Corn Dog Castle down the street. So this is exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe we can build a library in Slojamistan where the only book is this one. Welcome to the Hotel Nomad Mania. Essential reading and only reading. That might be uh, a good idea. Absolutely. Uh, in line with the spirit of Micronation. Thank you. Um, well, Sultan, thank you very much for having me. This is your show. So, um, you know, feel free to address the public and uh, the almost 8 billion people in the world who are not yet citizens of Slojamistan. Uh, maybe you can have a final 
um, bid and try to convince them to, to become members of, well, not members, but citizens of Slow Jamistan. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Mr. Mitsidis, and uh, I, I consider you a friend and a brother and uh, a, a important part of our nation. Look, the webinar is not about Slow Yamistan, it is about uh, travelers and, uh, and people seeking uh, uh, new destinations, uh, people like yourself and myself with endless curiosity, and the reminder that uh, traveling does not end after you uh, visit all 193 uh, nations. There is many more places to see. Uh, many more territories, uh, both big, like uh, I saw Greenland for the first time uh, this year, which is not part of the 193, but I said I wanted to see it. But then all the way down to some of the smallest places like Zakistan or uh, Ladonia, Ad Atlantium, uh, Sealand, and so many of the amazing micronations out there. I will leave you with this. The great thing about micronationality and micronations is, is these places you can visit if not physically, you can always visit them virtually. I speak about Ladonia and Atlantium and Zakistan and, of course, Slow Yamistan. Um, we strive to um, bring history in real life in real time. So, for example, um, Ladonia is talking about uh, they are going to maybe annex a village. Um, as Nomad Mania members, we can watch this unfold in real life and, and be a part of history. We can sign up and perhaps be a citizen of these micronations. And uh, if not just watch, even participate in history in the making. There are not many UN countries that you can actually have an active role in, for example, parliament or voting or uh, um, you know, actually building a nation. Most of these nations invite you to come in and, and be a part of them. So if I would leave you with anything, um, it is um, uh, a suggestion to do just that, to go down the rabbit hole, to have some time on uh, your spare time on the weekend, to Google around and uh, watch some videos, go to some websites, learn more about these uh, fantastic micro nations. There are so many more that we did not uh, speak about. And of course, yes, I welcome you with open arms to Slow Yamistan, and I look forward to seeing you uh, very soon in Slow Yamistan or somewhere else uh, around the world. I'll leave you by showing you my, my map on the wall. That is the big uh, Sultan map. And I think you, think you have a, a fantastic weekend. And once again, to Harry and everybody behind the scenes at uh, Nomad Mania, like Roof and Orest, uh, and all of our distinguished guests today, and everybody in the chat room and watching, uh, thank you so very much. And Viva Ployamistan and Viva Nomad Mania. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.